eating. One item of life consumes another item of life. That's all there is to it. But that's a lot, because everything that lives has to eat. Again, and again, and again. An animal is what it is, its shape, its size, its style of life, because of what it eats and what might eat it. Eat, drink, 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 eat. animals do. A baby mammal. It's born with the compulsion to suck. Mammals are called mammals because they have mammary glands to feed their babies with. Mammals make food. And when a mammal's born, the first important thing it does is find that food and suck it, drink it, eat it. Convert it from its mother's body to its own. Baby mammals drink custom-made milk and grow fast. But mammals aren't the only animals that produce their own baby food. Amazonian discus fish begin their eating career with a rich mucus that their parents exude from the sides of their bodies. And they graze on it. This not only gives them something to eat, but it keeps them close and away from the jaws of big fish. If for some reason the mucus fails to materialize, and that does happen occasionally, it only takes a few hours for all the babies to die. As time passes, baby mammals gradually begin to savor the world beyond milk. And if they belong to one of the bigger brain species, to learn the tricks that make eating easier. <laughs> the paraphernalia and rituals that go with eating vary a lot among human cultures, but all cultures do have their own rules and tools. and human children spend many dinner times learning about them. One thing young grizzly bears have to learn is even trickier. Alaska's sockeye salmon hit the river in the season when bears have to fatten up for hibernation. A bear that can't catch the fish may not wake up next spring. The cubs come to study, substitute hooks for teeth and claws, and the technique's not much different from one used by Brazilian catfish fishermen. get them on the jump. And you miss a lot. But when you do catch one, 
It's a happy occasion. And worth all the trouble. The Brazilians are so proud of their fish that they carve their names on them. The grizzlies just take them away and eat them. Being humans, the fishermen are a little more ceremonious than that. But in both cases, the fish are meant for the family. For the cubs, dinner is also an education. As for the Brazilian children, just liking the fish so much makes them anxious to learn how to catch and cook them. And as for the monkeys, they've learned how to get their catfish too. Hang out in the right tree. Since modern humans evolved about 100,000 years ago, their dietary relationship with the rest of the natural world has been mainly as a hunter of large animals. It was the invention of throwable weapons that made this possible, and all over the world there are ancient rock paintings showing the nobility of the beast and the glory of the spear-toting hunter. Nowadays, most people don't live that life anymore but relics of the old glory persist in certain rituals and sports. Among the most bloody, this one. The bull is domesticated, bred to want to kill men in fancy dress. And the man is a professional entertainer. The fact that the man is sometimes gored and that the bull always dies is real enough. And even though any meat that results is only a sideline, the crowd could be hungry tribesmen from 30,000 years ago. And of course, dotted around the world today, there are still a few real hunters. This is Indonesia, and the quarry is wild pig. This is East Africa. The quarry is Colobus monkey, and the hunters are those cousins of humans, chimpanzees. The men have dogs and spears, otherwise they'd steer well clear of a fiercely defensive 300-pound boar The chimps have nothing to stab with, or any tame species to help them, which is why their quarry has to be something they can kill by hand. But the hunt is organized, and the hunters are as excited as the human hunters are. Only the male chimps take part. Different ones climb different trees so that they can surround the monkey in the canopy. The strategy is set and the chase begins.
the same kind of thing happens in the chimp's chase. The monkey reaches a tree where there's no escape. The pig is trussed. The monkey dismembered. Chimps don't eat meat very often. When they do, it seems to coincide with the female being in heat. She begs for meat, and the males show off by getting it for her. The common ancestor of chimps and humans lived about five million years ago. And since both chimps and humans hunt and outwit their quarry in much the same way, it's possible that the ancestor hunted too, or at least that the urge to hunt is very deep in both chimp and human instincts. Modern Western humans still hunt sometimes, but they also have other ways of getting the same thrill. In this society, money is essential to life, to eating, among other things. By risking money, they risk a little bit of life, and by winning it, they land their quarry. That a medium for this is dogs chasing what they think is a hare only rounds off the comparison. Usually all a human has to do is to want to eat something and then that something, however dangerous, is as good as dead. There's very little in this Amazonian rainforest that's immune to being killed by these Piaroa Indians. A coati, easy game for the Piaroa when they're interested. But today they're not. Today they're after a delicacy. So, as it happens, is the coati, the same delicacy. the giant tarantula. Just touching one of these with its venomous hairs can result in days of excruciating soreness. It throws its hairs too. An animal that gets its snout too close can breathe the hairs in and choke to death. But never mind, the hunter has a technique. So does the coati. It quickly rolls the spider in the dirt and the hairs start to come off. The hunter lures it out. It took a special session with the tribe's shaman to prepare the man's mind for this. Not a hair or fang touched. Coatis are related to raccoons and have the same dexterity. This one pummels the tarantula around as if it were rolling dough. The spider's still very much alive and will be until it's time to cook it. So it goes into a custom-made vine leaf carrying pouch. This one's de-haired and dead and almost ready to eat. Done. When cooked, it's said to taste like crab. The coati knows how to avoid the fangs on the spider's underside. What it doesn't know is that capuchin monkeys have spotted its treetop nest where its baby is. Coates and capuchins are old enemies. Which animal wins any confrontation depends largely on where they're holding it. The ground is more coati territory. 
and the trees belong to the agile capuchins. But because of even worse threats than capuchins, the coati builds its nests in trees. Because, perhaps, of the extensive tarantula preparation, the mother has stayed away too long. And now the baby's gone. That's eating. In one way or another, something, or part of something, has to die in the process. And when it's a whole animal, there'll often be something around to miss it. This is the end of the dry season and a hard time for everything here. It's just a bit of luck that this is also when coatis nest. It's also a bit of luck that it can vary its diet if it has to. These proboscis monkeys can't. They're built to eat only one kind of food, leaves. But that's all right, they get along. In this mangrove swamp in Borneo, if there's a whole lot of anything, it's leaves. The monkeys climb, swim, and eat leaves. That's life. They've got big pot bellies that really are two stomachs full of bacteria that digest cellulose, the substance that makes leaves indigestible to many other animals. And to go with these wonderful bellies, the males have big, beautiful noses. At least that's what the females think. The noses are a kind of sexual display. Climb, swim, eat, look beautiful, have sex. Is there anything wrong in this proboscis paradise? Yes, the leaves. Trees don't happen to like animals eating their leaves, and so almost all of them pump poison into the greenery. Only one kind, mainly, this one, the sonoratia tree, has leaves that aren't poisonous. And not only do proboscis monkeys eat nothing but leaves, they eat practically nothing but sonoratia leaves. That's why they spend so much time swimming, to get from one sonoratia tree to another. Leave out the water, and it would be like living in a desert, with sonoratia oases dotted here and there. Harvester termites do live in deserts, and they cut down on travel time by making hay. In the damp season of the year, when plants do appear near their nest, they go out and reap them. This is the Kalahari in southern Africa, where the nights are very cold. So the termites only work in the daytime, which is why their heads are black, to protect them from the sun. But they're not in the sun very often, only when the grass is there. The rest of the time, they're in their nest, living on the grass that they've stored in their termite silos. It's a simple enough idea take the food that's there in the good times as a hedge against the bad. It's simple, but it's the first step towards a concept that can turn an ordinary species into a master race. Agriculture. Store your food, stock it up. And while you're at it, make certain there is food. Shortcut the whims of nature and plant the seeds yourself. Forget about praying for rain, you add the water. 
and you kill the pests. The idea seems to have popped into the human brain about 10,000 years ago. Since then, the human population has increased from about 10 million to 6 billion. Vast amounts of land have been commandeered from random nature and brought under human control. Made to produce the plants that humans want to eat. Human agriculture produces many different kinds of plants, but not as many as might be found in, say, an acre of natural rainforest. What matters, though, is that food, however limited in scope, is always dependably there. But humans weren't the first animals to have the idea. What humans have been doing for thousands of years Central American leafcutter ants have been doing for millions. They cut out sections of leaves from plants near their nest and, in long columns that look like regattas of sailboats, carry them home. The leaves aren't for the ants to eat. When they reach the nest, the carrier ants hand them over to other, smaller ants, which cut the leaves up. Then other, still smaller ants chew them into a mulch and hand them over to even smaller ants that, in the depths of the nest, use the mulch to cultivate a fungus. And that's what all the ants eat. It's a fungus that grows nowhere but in leafcutter ant colonies. It's a crop. And it's made the leafcutters very successful. Theirs are amongst the largest ant colonies anywhere in the world. Whether food comes from farming or from wild plants, as this load of Brazil nuts does, the real key to prosperity is gathering the food while it's abundant and storing it for when it isn't. Almost the entire human economic system is based on this principle. These men aren't exactly storing the nuts, they're getting ready to sell them. But the money they'll make is in itself a kind of storage because they can use it later to buy other kinds of food. But in the absence of money, other animals that store food have to do it more literally, and in the case of the North American acorn woodpecker, copiously and precisely. Instead of hammering for insects, the bird uses its pecking power to make sockets in the trunks of trees. Then it slots an acorn into each one. The socket has to be just right, too small and the acorn rots. Too big and it gets stolen. Once a stash was found of 5,000 nuts. That's a lot for a woodpecker, but a human might not even notice 5,000 nuts in his local supermarket. There are so many thousands of other things. This is the food store taken to such an extreme that there seems to be no outside world at all. No farms, no seasons, no geographical distances. Just food that developed inside its own packaging. But it still falls in the definition of store as much as a leopard's store does. Unlike lions and other big cats, a leopard doesn't always eat its kills on the spot where it killed them. It takes advantage of its skill at climbing trees and stashes its meat up in the branches. This solves a couple of problems. Non-climbing predators and scavengers can't steal it. And a solitary leopard doesn't have to eat a big animal all at once. Instead, it can stretch the food out over two or three days and skip hunting. Another food store and its owner, a fiscal shrike, or butcher bird. Shrikes are well known in Africa for killing small birds and impaling them on thorns or barbed wire fences. Then they slowly eat them over a number of days. 
Stretching out the kill this way gives them a lot of time to just sit around and contemplate the landscape. And they don't have to worry much about the food being stolen. The Shrikes have a reputation for jealously guarding their meat. Another bird comes near and it gets attacked and impaled. There is an alternative to storage, and these seabirds, boobies, are painfully aware of it. Boobies are hard-working, deep-diving catchers of fish. They spend their days flying low over the water and plunging down for any fish they see. And while they're looking for fish, bigger birds, frigate birds, are watching them. Sometimes when a booby catches something, this happens. A tweak at the tail feathers, and the frigate bird tries to take the fish right out of the booby's beak. There, the booby drops it, and the frigate bird delicately plucks it off the surface of the sea, because a frigate bird will drown if it gets its feathers wet. So, if it's young and not very good at snatching up fish while it flies, it lets the waterproofed birds do the work. And eats as well as any of them. Robbing other birds of their food is one thing. Robbing them of a whole season's breeding effort is a little more serious. Doing it on a mass scale seems almost sinister. But then Quelia, the birds whose nests are being raided by this marabou stork, are a mass sort of bird. They're called locust birds by the Africans because of their vast flocks and their habit of completely covering trees with their little pendulous nests. Quelia are probably the most numerous birds in the world. And so when a marabou picks their chicks like apples, it's just a bad thing happening on the scale the locust birds are used to. And as for the marabou, it's a change in the carrion it usually eats. Storks have evolved very versatile beaks. They can pluck chicks out of nests or scour for the mussels that are abundant in this African river. A baboon uses its hands for the same thing. And when it gets a mussel, it applies its teeth to the problem of opening it. Without really solving the problem. Mongooses like mussels too. They search by sight and smell. And when a mongoose finds one, it has its own method of defeating the shell. The stork would like to pry it apart. If only the thing would sit still. Finally, the crowbar works. The mongoose is still at the anvil. Opposable thumbs turn out to be handy. and a vervet monkey gets its scraps on a plate. Plates, 
bowls, utensils, all kinds of tools. The natural human situation is to be surrounded by such things. Chemical tools too. Pierrot Indians get ready for tomorrow's hunting by tipping their darts with curare, the deadly muscle relaxant they get from a forest vine. Tomorrow comes. Using tools also means developing special skills. There was more than a blowpipe and curare at work here. There were years of practice. Humans use lots of different kinds of tools and use them routinely. But other animals do use tools sometimes. An Egyptian vulture trying out rocks. It needs to find just the right one for the job. A cheetah meets an ostrich egg. It would make a great meal and it doesn't need to be chased. But how do you get the thing open? The Egyptian vulture knows, and the cheetah definitely doesn't. Neither does the jackal, although it at least tries. Now the way's clear for the vulture. It sizes the egg up. And then reaches for its tool. It hasn't got perfect skill with the rock. But it's got the idea. And what it lacks in aim, it makes up for in persistence. There. Problem cracked. A hard outer casing isn't much of a barrier to a tool using human. Or a tool using chimp. Chimps are second only to their human cousins in the variety of tools they use and the skill they have with them. They spend a good part of their childhood learning how to do this. A human boy picks it up a little faster, but he's got a better tool too. Among chimps, nutcracking can be a social occasion. They learned how to do this together, or were taught by one of the others, and there was a kind of bonding over the rocks and the nuts. The sort of thing that chimps and humans learn to do, some birds do instinctively. This is a finch being a woodpecker. It's happening in the Galapagos Islands, where there aren't any woodpeckers. No birds to hammer their beaks into insect holes and extract grubs with their long tongues. So, way back in evolution, woodpecker finches spotted the vacancy and, with the help of a tool, began to do the job themselves. This one enlarged the opening with its beak, and now it's using a cactus spine, carefully selected for length, to do what a woodpecker's tongue does.
This is a chimp being a clever primate. Chimps don't stop at rocks and nuts. They've got uses for sticks too. It's termites the chimps after. The fierce guards in the mounds attack anything that seems to be invading and cling to it with their pincers. And carefully extracted, they're a treat on a stick. If the stick's not the right length, the chimp will fix it. So it's not only using a tool, it's trimming it to specification. Humans long ago learned to use the tool to end all tools. They brought fire under control. <laughs> They did this and they conquered the world. Chimps didn't. They survive perfectly well in their part of Africa, eating a range of plants and animals that are native to the same place they're native to. They're like the cousin that stayed on the farm. They're fine and as they should be. But humans, with this, became able to survive almost anywhere. Fire could keep them warm in cold places, but it also meant that they could eat just about anything. Anything. Fire breaks down the structure, the resistance, of almost any meat and makes it digestible. It also helps make it taste good. It turns humans into the universal predator. It has meant they could migrate to and live in places they're not native to. And over tens of thousands of years, humans have used this ability to colonize the whole planet. Humans originally come from Africa, not South America. Giant tarantulas aren't natural to the human diet. But with fire, who cares? Anyway, a fang makes a good toothpick. There are other kinds of tools too, living ones. A market in France for one of the most expensive foods in the world. Truffles. They're the cream of mushrooms, and they sell for about $800 a pound. The customers here are restaurateurs who come from all over the world to one of the few places where truffles are found. They can't be cultivated. and they can't very easily be found. Truffles are a fungus that grows on oak and their fruiting bodies, the good part, are underground. There's no way a human could ever know exactly where to look for them and even dogs' noses often fail. But pigs, they love them and they know where truffles are. The pigs are human tool for finding truffles, it gets a life measurably better than most other domestic pigs get. Not to mention some truffles of its own. And the human gets truffles and rich. But an animal doesn't have to be anything's tool to make a fair exchange. This bird is an ox pecker. All over Africa, it can be seen riding unmolested on the backs of large mammals. And the reason it's unmolested is that it's doing the animals a service. 
It's eating their ticks. It's keeping them clean. What the oxpecker gets out of it, of course, are the ticks. Ticks are what it eats. Not every relationship between species involves ownership or lethal competition. Although some animals are unwittingly used. A North American Rivoli's hummingbird makes its rounds, its wings beating 60 times a second, while its bill withdraws a dose of sugary nectar and gives some mites a platform to a free ride. While the bill is in the flower, the mites, which live on nectar themselves, come aboard. And when the bird goes to another flower, they disembark. This way they can spread throughout the forest, finding new feeding grounds and new mites to breed with. The hummingbird knows nothing and just keeps humming along. There are uncountable instances of humans using animals, but the relationship isn't always one way. A garbage dump in Africa. And a collection of many of the animals from this part of the world. Humans tend to be pretty picky about what parts of their meat and vegetables they eat. And they throw a lot of really good stuff away, which makes this hole in the ground a veritable food mine. And brings together animals, relatively peaceably, that might normally be at each other's throats. So human garbage creates a little animal utopia Sunrise on the shore of Lake Tandinika and some village fishermen get ready for a day on the water. When the fishermen leave, farther up the shore, chimps start to appear. They're from the nearby Gombe National Park, and the lake shore is the western edge of their range. The village is more or less deserted now, and the chimps can have the run of it. But they always head for one place, the hut where the men salt down the fish, and leave behind a lot of salt, which, for the chimps, makes it the local salt lick. Salt is a mineral, and when an animal eats salt, it's eating something that's never been alive. It's a rare instance of animals doing what plants do all the time, absorbing a mineral directly. This happens because salt is vital to certain bodily functions, and there's often just not enough of it in the plants that animals eat. For humans, it's always been a valuable commodity, even a currency. Nations have fought wars over it. Chimps and other animals just use their ingenuity and get it where they can. These butterflies by the Amazon get salt from the sand. Down among the grains, in a liquid form that butterflies with their nectar-sucking mouthparts can manage.
so salt gives the riverbank a nice touch of yellow. A leaf. And an animal eating it. But not exactly munching it or gulping it down. What the chimp is doing is taking it. It's the leaf of an Aspelia plant, a kind of sunflower, and it contains a chemical that fights infections caused by worms. Not everything that's eaten is food. Red colobus monkeys on the island of Zanzibar eat charcoal. Charcoal making is an important industry on the island, and the monkeys have learned to hang around the charcoal ovens and pick up bits and pieces of the stuff. Why? The trees. Most of these are not native. They come from India, mainly. But red colobus are African leaf-eating monkeys, with stomachs adapted to African leaves. And Indian leaves are hard to digest, are even a little poisonous. They give the monkeys stomach ache. And the monkeys have discovered, quite on their own, that charcoal relieves stomach ache. The reason, incidentally, that there's a shortage of native trees is that most of them have been turned into charcoal. A mountain gorilla in Rwanda's Virunga National Park. The green stuff it's eating is fresh gorilla feces. Gorillas are intelligent animals and wouldn't eat such a thing if there weren't some reason. It could be that there's still some nutrition in it and it's getting recycled. Or maybe it's just something warm on a cold day. Whatever, it couldn't be any worse for the gorilla than some of the things these humans are ingesting. Some that are downright poisonous. Alcohol damages kidneys, liver, brain cells, and who knows what other parts of the body. People realize this, but all over the world, they drink it anyway. Because intoxication is fun. And sometimes it's more than that. This Pieroa Indian, preparing a batch of the local hallucinogenic, Yopo, isn't exactly expecting a night on the tiles. This is serious, even reverential. He's getting in touch with the spirits of the forest, the spirits that provide for all the Pieroa's needs. And that includes the food they eat. Yopo is important. People. Animals, people and animals. What's the big difference? Their early reactions to sex? Their tools? Their play? Their masculine contests? Fighting, display, food, love, social systems.
old age. What is the difference? Is it really very much? 